Hello, Thought Bubble digital attendee people, people that are meant to be at Thought Bubble. Um, my name is Michael Conrad, and I'm very pleased to have been asked to put together something for the uh, digital programming for Thought Bubble this year. And immediately um, when I was asked to do so, uh, these three people came to mind. There, there was uh, no one else that popped into my mind at all. So to my other comic creating friends who do a lot of self-publishing, I'm sorry, you're just a little less important than, than the three people that are joining me today. I would love it if we could all just kind of uh, go, in a, go in a circle and introduce ourselves, although I guess uh, there is no circle in the digital realm. Uh, so Becky, why don't you go ahead? Hi, uh, my name is Becky Clunan, and I'm actually, Michael and I are in the same house, we're just in other rooms, um, so that's fun. Um, I, I worked on Gotham Academy for DC Comics and Batman and Punisher, and, um, but I also like to self-publish, so that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, Erica, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I'm Erica Price, I'm a self-published comic uh, comic cartoonist type thing um, and I'm I guess I'm mostly known for my comic disorder which is a experimental horror comic about self-destruction and grief and trauma and fun stuff like that <laughs> yeah all of our favorite subjects all in one yeah. <laughs> Shelly I'm Shelly Bond and I have been editing comics since 1988 if you don't believe me, you can zoom the camera in, but then I'll, I, I will go like this. <laughs> I've been doing Kickstarters over the past few years and have been having a blast um, doing comics on my own and taking over the landscape. So yeah, Michael, thank you so much for the introduction, which um, man, I kind of think you were sucking up to everybody, but that's okay. We also <laughs> were paid handsomely to join you today. so. I'll kick it back to you and see where yeah. we go. Well, um, I'm glad that you haven't tried to cash that check yet because um, <laughs> what? Hey, Are you, you guys got paid? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we all got paid. I just got a message <laughs> from Zoom telling me that they've sent me a gift to allow us uh, another 40 minutes of conversation time. I didn't realize that Zoom... Um, did that so thank you I, I, I guess i guess you've impressed them already i i know it was right when you were talking i was like wow is shelly paid me back this is great um speaking Not quite. of me uh that's like the big um that's the big issue with self-publishing for a lot of people i think um when i started self-publishing it was kind of well one it was because i knew no one would be interested in publishing the types of things that i was doing um it, it is, was just wait, so. Is, is this where I'm supposed to bring out the tiny violin and the box of tissues and say boo hoo hoo? Yeah, you, you feel okay. feel sorry for. No, it's part of every creator's journey. I think is that early on uh, moment, and for some of us, that moment lasts a lifetime, where no one really uh, cares or believes in you enough to invest in you. Uh, for me, I came to comics from playing music and. Uh, it was just a means of me continuing to be able to express myself in some way. And I thought, oh, comics are a thing that I can do that's completely just me. Mm -hmm. I totally forgot that I'm not a, not a great illustrator. Certainly wasn't at the time. Uh, I didn't know how to put together files and, and do all the kinds of uh, the things that you typically would learn over a long stretch of time or call in somebody else to help you with. So I quickly realized it's kind of a collaborative effort when it comes to making comics. So I created Mystery School Comics Group years ago, <clears throat> which was a very loose collective of people of, of a similar stature within comics to me, which is to say no stature at all. And we kind of pooled our money and our resources and our collective knowledge of how to how to do the thing. And uh, we started Wait, a second. Wait yeah. a second, I have to ask, how did you trick Becky Clunan into this operation? 
because clearly she has a pretty prestigious profile in comics. Oh, we're Becky. we're gonna get to that. Yeah. Oh, our, okay. Becky, our, Becky and I have known each other our whole life. So when I started putting together comics, she was an immediate resource. She was already doing artwork for bands that I had been in for years and years. Um, so naturally, when I said. I'm going to start making comics. She was the person who was like the first one to read my scripts and to give me um, like really valuable information. She would send me other people's scripts and uh, give me, give me a lot of feedback on that stuff. Um, but to show you, so when we started doing it, we would do these like little anthologies and this has always been kind of my preferred size for publishing things. Um, in part because I feel like it feels less temporary than a big floppy comic, which gets damaged really easily. And they weren't like with this, it wasn't thick enough to be able to like in later things that we published, we did switch to a bigger size, but it was big enough where it could have um, like a, a spine on it. I don't know if that's being picked up. So we went from, doing like little smaller floppier ones, the bigger ones with a spine. Um, and that was all done collectively. So where Becky comes into it, beyond being, um, being a good person and a good resource to me early on, was when Becky and I <clears throat> started dating each other, we were both working with a fulfillment company <clears throat> and it was it was really cool that we didn't have to pack our own things, but we also we wanted to claim more agency over the stuff that we were that we were okay. sending to people. We wanted to establish a greater relationship with the people that we were selling our product to. So when we reclaimed our things, obviously Becky's Becky Clunan, you know, she's the the god empress of comics. Um, she needed a name to to work under, and I said, "Oh, I've got I've got the name. Like, I, it's this collective that I've been doing for years and years." But <laughs> Becky had been self-publishing while working for these big publishers like Marvel and DC, and I'd love to hear about that experience, Becky. Yeah, um, I started out making mini comics before I was even like when I was in college. I went to school for animation. Um, and ended up in like the Meat House Collective. Uh, so that was like, there was some like incredible artists there who I was going to school with at the time. It was like Tomer Hanukkah and James Jean and Farrell Darumple and um, Nate Powell. Just some like people who are like heavy hitters right now who we were all in, we were all self-publishing together when we started. So that kind of like kicked things off. Um, and then that said like, how, when I went to conventions, I would use cons as like uh, a deadline being like, okay, I'm going to get my next mini comic done for like this convention. And that mini comic might have like three five page stories in it or something like they were all pretty short. Um, and then when I started doing comics full time, I had less time to work on like my own, like weirdo personal stuff. Um, and then I, I, there came a point in time around like 20, I want to say like 2011 or something when I got, I was like, okay, I want to write my own thing. Cause I had been an artist for writers for so long. And that's when I did this mini comic called wolves, which is right here. Um, so I did that in 2011. And then every year after that, I did another one. Um, and then I and self published. I, again, I noticed that you've done it at a smaller size. Uh, for the me, reason part why it was is pragmatic just, for it, mailing. It was a little cheaper to mail. It's cheaper to mail and it's like half of a 11 by 17, which is like the US standard size. So we just, you know. So you know that if you were to republish it at the standard comic size, the ratio would be? It was all off. I had to reformat everything. Yeah, so re reprinting it with image after I did, because I, I printed my own graphic novel, which is just the black and white version of all the stories. And this one, I think I did 2,000 copies of in English and in French. I published this one when I was living in Montreal. And then I brought it to Image and had Lila Ridge color it, um, who's an incredible colorist. And that had to get reformatted because Image is like standard comic size. So it's just been 
you know, my life of resizing these pages, which I should like, have just done them all at like standard comic size to begin do you with. Like but. How, do you like how I ask, uh, so that worked to do that? No, that did not work at all. Nice. So well, <laughs> I'm, glad you're in, I'm glad you're in separate rooms. Otherwise, I think there'd be blood on the walls right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have to interject by saying, if you didn't believe me before, about my age and how I've been in comics for 30 years, I can tell you with a straight face that I discovered Becky's work through her mini comics. That's when true. When she was at SBA, when she was working um, back in the early 2000s. And I believe I gave you your first official big two job. You did. If I'm not mistaken. You did. That was American Virgin. Yep. Okay. Wow. Just wanted to be sure that I'm still legit. Wow, I, Shelly, uh, trying to steal Becky away from self-publishing, I, I see. I, uh, so, Shelly, here's a good opportunity for y you to tell us ab about um, the kind of the differences that you experienced in working for these big multinational companies and now uh, focusing more on the, the stuff that you're passionate about and the stuff that uh, you're self-funding. Well, let me just be straight up with you about this. I was not a comics fan, did not get into comics to work on superheroes and never had any intention of working for the man, um, air quotes or not, but I happened to get a great opportunity when Vertigo launched. So got into comics in college, discovered Love and Rockets. So I was always like an indie comics reader and I just, got lucky and interviewed with Karen Berger in 1992, got to start at Vertigo as an editor, uh, an assistant editor and work my way up um, until I left in 2016. And it was actually a great thing because in my heart, I never thought I would be with a corporation for that long because I want to make comics that I want to read. I mean, end of. You know, there's working with a corporation, you know, if you love the characters and your dream is always to write Punisher or Superman, good for you, go for it. Um, it's, uh, it's exhausting, but if that's your thing, then you need to like live the dream. But for me, I was much more interested in the experimental and arty side of comics. So where I am right now is exactly where I had hoped to be from when I was a teenager because I've always been into pushing boundaries, subverting expectations, and also just art, you know, art as expression and making cool stuff. So that's what I love about Kickstarter. You can do essentially anything you'd like on Kickstarter. And if you don't know how to do it, it's a community. There are people there that can help you out. So I am 100% into the whole platform of Kickstarter and it's become a really crowded marketplace because really anyone can do it. You just have to be open-minded. You have to do your research, you know, put in the time. I was lucky enough to go from Vertigo to running my own imprint for IDW. It was called Black Crown. So for three years, my husband and I pretty much became a, a small boutique publishing house. So I learned how to letter comics. Uh, we learned how to assemble them and make sure we were doing all the digital specs correctly. I mean, just like Becky said, you know, things change so much. When I started in comics, we were still um, learning how to color comics by using color guides. And uh, we had to put the correct percentages of color in pencil on a piece of paper so that the people who were separating our books could actually cut out the film to, to print color. So it sounds like the dark ages, it kind of was, but a lot changed in the 90s. So you got to keep up with technology because things now are easier and better than ever in putting together comics and to making your comic book dreams come true, like this one, Insider yeah. Art. And then so actually, right, I'm Art was that. just, just uh, met its funding on Kickstarter and is now off to the races and it's not your first big win on kickstarter Thank um you. kickstarter is before i get into kickstarter i just want to say it's really heartening and cool 
to to know that um, this learning process of making comics and doing so yourself is something that continues on. You're you're a seasoned pro. Um, so to hear you say, oh, we were learning how to do this and that, and your lettering is so incredible. And to know yeah. oh, something that you just taught yourself how to do over some time. Yeah. Um, Hot kettle. I mean, that's you as well. You letter your own work. You're doing your own art. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, you're throwing out compliments, but you need some props as well because... Thank you so much. The, yeah, the bottom line is don't let anyone tell you what to do. Just step up and swing. Just do it. And if you fall on your face, just step up and do it again. I mean, that's basically how people get ahead in life. And I think what happens sometimes when you work for corporations for many, many years, it's very easy to get bogged down. It's very easy to listen to someone who's above you on the food chain tell you, that's ah, a little too weird. It's not quite right. You're being self-indulgent. Indulge too bad. You know, life is short. We're all living in these strange pandemic times. This is the best time to just say, forget everybody else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the book that I was put on planet earth to promote. And that's another really important part. You got to promote yourself. <laughs> you got to come, you got to come up with ways that make you stand apart from the crowd. And again, the community in self publishing and in indie comics is unlike any other. And so you just have to reach out. I, I used to always tell people uh, when they were breaking into comics, go to conventions go to tables, talk to artists, talk to writers, talk to editors. They've been in your shoes and there's nothing people like more than to help other people and pay it forward. If they're good people, if they're not good people, if they're trash, just walk away. It's very yeah. simple. Speaking of community, I'm going to get back to you and uh, we'll talk about what's scary about Kickstarter, <clears throat> but Erica's uh, work was brought to my attention through a, a mutual friend of ours in England uh, who's really into uh, a lot of the same stuff that, that I'm into. And when I was looking for incredible uh, horror comics that are unlike anything else, uh, Erica's work was what he directed me to. And I quickly um, found that Erica does her thing is similar to the way that Becky and I do with an online web shop and kind of handling every element of it um, on their own. So Erica, how did, what happened? How did you end up doing this? Like, what happened? Tell us what uh, happened? I, I asked myself that. I was studying fashion um, in London and uh, I got really ill basically and completely burnt out on it. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't what I imagined when I was at school, basically. And um, I was sort of looking for things to fill my time reading. And I read, uh, you know, stuff like Hellblazer and Hellboy, the sort of older comics. And then Is I Is anything um, with hell in the title? And you're apparently, like... yeah, I, I was, I, I was really unhappy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I got put onto uh, Sophie Campbell and Joe Keating's Run on Glory, which at the time I was really frustrated with fashion. It felt really, it felt like you couldn't talk about stuff. It felt like you had to do stuff a certain way. And I read that book and I felt like it just, it said more about women and about women's bodies and about body image than anything you could do in fashion. And that wasn't even the main part of the story. That was all going on in the background with what Sophie was doing with the character design. And I was just like, that just looks so much better. <laughs> um, and so it sort of got to the point where I wasn't well enough to continue the course. And so I, I had was sort of sat there going, well, what am I going to spend my time doing? And I thought, well, I can draw, I can draw human bodies because <laughs> I'd done fashion illustration. So I'd give comics a go and then found out that there was a lot I needed to learn. But um, I mean, all of you have touched on this with uh, things like uh, page dimensions and um, learning to letter and things like that. I, I sort of put out a thing on Twitter a few days ago, sort of saying for people who do self-publish, what's one thing you wish you'd known before you started it? And for people who haven't yet, what, what, what would you like to know? And a lot of it is, you know, how do I promote my work? How do I 
how do I make sure it doesn't turn into a blurry mess when I print it? Where should I print? Stuff like that. And I feel like we've answered that really well. Part of it is trial and error, but also part of it is community and just going and asking people um, and going to convention. People, if you say to people, oh, I'm thinking of doing it, generally they're really excited for you and they'll give you a lot of advice. Um, and obviously at the moment you can't just go to conventions, unfortunately. But social media and stuff, a lot of people are quite happy to chat a bit on social media still. So it's definitely, as a community, it's very nurturing, I've found, certainly compared to where I was before. So, um, so yeah, I, I just sort of fell into it as a sort of something to spend my time doing and found it really fulfilling. Uh, and for for the sort of self-publishing and selling stuff, I actually, I, I started at the start of this year. Um, and the plan was to that start. Really? To just publish. just since the start of this year? Yeah. So I, I've been making comics since 2017. Um, and Disorder came out in America through Disquette Press last year. And I started the self-publishing, the UK edition of Disorder this year. Uh, and the plan was to go and do some conventions for the first time. And uh, and then that quickly turned out to not be the case. So I sort of had to quickly sort of think, oh, God, I'd, I'd ordered all my stock already. <laughs> so I was like, oh, no. Oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> uh, so I, I, and at the time, there was sort of a short period in the UK where we weren't sure if what was going to happen to the post offices either, if they were going to shut. So it was a bit like, ah. Uh, luckily the post offices were still going so I sort of focused on selling online instead um, and it, it's gone okay. I know that Shelly has had <clears throat> Insider Art was in its initial life was uh, available on Gumroad um, at, a, at suggested donated rates. Um, has, Becky I, I have you ever had any of your stuff available on Gumroad or I know you've got a couple of things on Comixology uh, through Comixology Submit, right? Yeah, I've never done Gumroad, but I've I love buying things on Gumroad, so I've always wanted to I've always wanted to try it. But um, for whatever reason, I'm just you know I'm so stuck on the getting these print copies out of the house. <laughs> so. Erica, is is your stuff on Gumroad or any uh, other place on the internet? It will be. It, I will have something on there by the time this goes out, but at the moment, no. I, I, I um, disorder disorder started as a web comic, and sort of I want to keep it sort of freely available as a web comic. Um, so it, it didn't really make sense to do a digital edition of the book. Um, but my next book, which is coming out in November, uh, will have a digital version on there. So I've been I've been having a look at it and. I think what's nice about where we are today with comics is that you have the option to do both. And I think what's really important to impart to people who, who think about digital is that it's cheaper for you as a self-publisher. However, there are always fees, no matter which road you choose. A company like Gumroad will take a percentage because, of course, they're providing a service to you. And I have to say, as someone who's just used it for the first time for insider art, it's been terrific because it's pretty seamless. Once you actually prepare your digital files and upload them correctly, basically, you just wait for your payment to come in once a week. And Gumroad will take out their percentage ahead of time. So everything that you receive into a bank account that you have to set up um, that's specifically for your project, that money then becomes your money. And in the case of insider art, it's, it's money that we're donating to female and non-binary retailers. Because the two minute story about insider art, which is my shameless self-promotion, is that when the pandemic hit, and everybody was grumbling and we weren't really sure when printers would be open again. It seemed like the perfect opportunity for me to reach out to some old friends like Becky Clinton and others and also reach out to some new people I've wanted to work with. So many British artists and writers are just 
exploding on the comic scene. And I just wanted to get my hands on them. As an editor, I just was dying to work with them. So it was a great excuse to reach out and say, hey, let's put together a compendium of comics, crafts and cats, and do something that not only we could be proud of, but let's look after our own. Because at the time, you saw a lot of big publishers, um, you know, raising money for very worthwhile charities like Hero Initiative and Fink. But those charities were not specifically focusing on marginalized genders. And there are a lot of big companies that talk about it. They love buzzwords like diversity and inclusion, but they don't have the proof. And that's what this is. So in under three months during a global pandemic, and I've said that 3,000 times, but that's how I sum it up. 150 female and non-binary creators came together and created this wonderful compendium. Um, 270 pages, all ages. It's comics, crafts, and cats. There are eight editors. We were all challenged to fill 30 pages each. Um, the premise was an art house. Everybody got a room. I took the garage because I came up with the project. So I was only doing this if I could have a garage band. So that's my section. But there's terrific work by um, other wonderful female editors. And we just invited um, as many people as we could. And those people donated their time. So it's been up on Gumroad. We've raised over $6,000 right now. Wow. And we've been divvying it up to 28 female and non-binary comic book retailers who've been terrific and very appreciative. And this gives me a moment to thank everybody who's watching or everybody who might go to Gumroad. Thank you very much. Because you can pay what you want. You know, we suggest $10 for 270 pages, but Gumroad allows you to pay $2 if that's all you have. Everybody is strapped. And one of the reasons why we decided to do it on Kickstarter is because we wanted to actually get print copies to all the contributors. And we also wanted to make it available to people who prefer a paper reading experience. I'm old school. I'm a paper purist. It sounds like Becky is too. Um, I like me. holding a book. I like holding a book in my hands. So we went to Kickstarter. And one important thing that I want to impart to people who are thinking about using Kickstarter, the one caveat they have when you put together a book, you cannot just donate all the proceeds to charity. They have certain guidelines, and I highly recommend that if you're interested in Kickstarter, you not only go to their site, read everything you can, and it's a pretty intensive um, 101 on how to join, what it takes. They've got a great Q&A. They've got people who put up their do's and don'ts, trial and error, um, seasoned pros who kickstart it. But also book an appointment to talk with the Kickstarter lead, whether you want to work for their comics division or a different division. They've got people who are creating films and music and all kinds of like strange devices. Make sure you talk to the lead. That's why they're there. And they'll set up a time to chat with you over the phone or through Hangouts or through Zoom. They will impart valuable advice because one of the things that actually we looked into even before going to Gumroad digitally was whether we could just go right to Kickstarter. And the answer was no, because we could not just set up a charity for our female and non-binary retailers. So we went to Gumroad first and we're keeping insider art exclusively digitally up on Gumroad so that we can continue to raise funds for the retailers. But we went to Kickstarter to make the books, and thanks to 777 backers, we're going to be printing 1,200 copies of these, which, by the way, I'm correcting this weekend. So this was a nice break from my day job, which, by the way, my day job is, is a day for night job. Because if you wonder who the person is who's actually correcting mistakes, putting together the bio section, tweaking the font size, which for some reason was a little too big on this page. I have no one to blame but myself. Because part of insider art, even though I came up with the conceit, I wanted to do the assembly and the design and a, and a bunch of the lettering. And 
I knew I was going to have to do it myself. So that was my big project during the pandemic. So. Well, but. that's, that's the, the brilliant part about self publishing, right? It, I recently, I too did, did the thing that, that people said that they were going to do at the beginning of, of COVID and, and being isolated. I said, Oh, I'm going to make some mini comics. I, in quick succession, I, I made two mini comics that are available at uh, mysteryschool.bigcartel.com. And on the, on the very first one that I did, uh, there's a typo on the cover. Two, two significant typos on the cover. And um, when you're self-publishing, there isn't somebody that you can be angry at. Uh, you can only look inward. Um, but a friend of mine said, hey, everything that you do, that's just the, the first draft of it. The thing's going to have a life that goes on beyond you publishing your, your mini comic. Maybe you'll do a collection of them later and you'll adjust it then. Or when you reprint it, it's an opportunity to, uh, to do that. And that sounds like that's where you're at right now, Shelly, is taking these things and tweaking them. And I'm sure when you get the, get the final copy of it in your hand from from the printer that that'll be the day where you flip it open and you'll find oh there's a thing that i missed right there wait a minute are you saying i'm not perfect well i'm not saying that if that's what you want to take from it Shelley, I'm, that's... I'm, not, I'm, I'm this is a mic drop for me no seriously <laughs> i i i think that that's that's the truth about anything you do in life like you can't beat yourself up the best thing of all michael that you said is that like People talked about doing things like making their own mini comics, writing, drawing, learning how to play the guitar. Most people are, are all talk. There's a real difference between theory and execution. And like, bravo to you for actually walking the walk. Typo or not, I'm dying to know what the typo was. Can you share it with the viewers you, here? You know, as someone with a keen eye, and maybe not even a super keen eye will discover it, but I'm, I'm not one to point out my own flaws. Uh, not publicly anyway. I'll complain about it to Becky um, behind closed doors. Speaking well, of Becky, why do you, why do you even bother self publishing? Uh, it sounds to me like it's, it's clear that Shelly um, wanted more control over what she was doing uh erica is very new to comics so it's kind of like natural hey i'm gonna develop my although it's it's wild erica that you have a publisher already and an international publisher at that yeah, on yeah I, that that was very that was sort of a right place right time thing i sort of beautiful hey, hey, hey look at this web comic right at the point where she was looking for titles for diskettes sort of first and, wave stuff disorder is frankly it it doesn't take too much of a look at it to immediately be kind of knocked back by it. it's something that i encourage everyone to to look it up go to it Eric. was meant it was meant to be my um the project i did that no one would look at you know how you sort of a common piece of advice it's not the only way to do it but is to not do your dream project immediately but do something a bit shorter to people won't if you mess it up people won't notice <laughs> and it got out of hand um, so but yeah it, it's it's a it's a helpful it's a helpful thing for me it's uh, it's brilliant and everyone yeah. that sees it uh i've i've shared it with a bunch of my friends just being like hey you should look at this and uh everyone is like my goodness this is truly so, uh unique and powerful uh it's really really incredible and to know that you've only been making comics since 2017 is really yeah, scary i i started i think summer 2017 i started the first chapter of disorder i'd done technically the winter before that i did some test pages for a pitch uh about uh some like dogs that did like robot dogs and stuff um which uh very rightly didn't get picked up um but after that it was into disorder and just sort Great. of went 
I love um, it. Like, like Danny said, I sort of went, right, rather than waiting until I'm good enough to do the thing I want to do, I'm going to do the thing I can do right now. And I think, I think that's a trap a lot of people get into is they want to start making polished stuff immediately rather than going, I'm going to make something and improve and make something and improve. It's an iterative process. And yeah, maybe your first self-published comic is a mess, but you learn from it and go on to the next thing. That's, that's a really important piece. <laughs> I'm glad that somebody said it <clears throat> because, um, yeah, it is some of the, some of my early stuff I'd rather people just never saw. Um, and thankfully no one ever saw it because <laughs> no one cared. So that's like the, the consolation that you can give yourself early on is that, Hey, if a lot of people see it, it means it's doing something right and i'm doing something right and if not many people see it then it's nothing to be embarrassed about not that it's anything to be embarrassed about anyway it's your creation right. becky? i think it's the evolution you know <laughs> sorry i don't mean to step on I, no. i'm dying to hear becky's answer but i think what everyone's saying here is so true look you got to be fearless you just have to go for it you can't you know you, you're doing it for, for yourself first and foremost so you got to put yourself out there. And I think the other thing about community that is important, it's like, there are always people that are willing to be your beta reader. And you see that on social media. If anything, I think that's the best part of social media. If you're a writer and you need an artist, my goodness, there are so many people that are hungry to just start drawing. And you can find people in, in your circles on social media. With Kickstarter, the nicest thing I've seen to come out of COVID is that a lot of people on Kickstarter start to help promote each other through their campaigns. And even if they can't afford to, um, if they can't afford to actually back someone's campaign, then they, they often promote their campaign within their uh, story. So that's pretty cool. But over to Becky, because I just stepped on her moment to yeah. explain why she's self-publishing. Why? Why do you do oh, it? I don't know. I've just been doing it for so long. It feels like if I wasn't doing it, something would be missing at this point. Um, some of it is that I've like made up these short stories that I've been doing are all kind of like in the same world. So it makes sense to continue doing them that way. Um, I just like doing everything myself. That's kind of nice. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just one of those like an itch you got to scratch, you know, after a certain point. You just can we, can we talk about your tarot cards for a second? Because yeah, I could not believe my eyes. Becky, they're uh, magnificent and they're sold you. out. If I'm not they're sold out, mistaken. do you have any that you could hold up for the camera? Yes, I do. Um, let me see my boxes over here. So, this is the box, it's I got a little foil on it, which was fun. Um, these cards, so here are the cards. They, they're all based on my mini comics. So it was like a different way. Speaking of being self-indulgent, that's what these were. It was a very self-indulgent project of me being like, oh, I want to do Oracle cards of my characters. You know, it's, um, but that's incredible. And you know, self-indulgence is a fine thing. I mean, my MO in comics now is if you like my style and you like the types of stories that you see my name in the credits on, then follow me and read my stuff. You know, I like to work with people who tend to um, do the same things that I do and watch the same TV shows that I watch and study the same films that I do. So I think that's great. But continue. Yeah, it was and fun. Show us the it was cards. fun. Could you put the cards a little closer to the camera? Because I really think they're beautiful. And I think people need to see them in close up. I oh, believe, yeah. did you say it took you like, six months you've been working on them for a while oh yeah um i here's here's one of the cards um wow. yeah these cards they just i had see speaking of formatting again i had done them originally as like a larger set here we go so this is the original set was screen printed and then self coat like we had to collate them all ourselves um yeah so that they're like the new ones are a little bit smaller um the new ones are digitally printed on actual cards so you can shuffle them um, because the original run was so limited, um, it was basically like an art, like item. Um, 
And I, I've had people be like, oh, I'm scared to shuffle them. So they don't. <laughs> that's, that's one of the neat things about self-publishing too, to, to kind of tie it into the, uh, to that idea is there's no real, you, you had mentioned earlier, when you brought your book to Image, they want to do it at this particular size. When you're self-publishing, it's just whatever the heck you want to do. If you want to yeah. do an oversized thing that no one's going to want to buy because it's out of control and like and won't fit on your share. shelf <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can do these self-indulgent and i think i agree self-indulgence is important and it's a good thing it's a virtue um yeah, yeah. A, a lot like, of it's finding ways to like um fund the project in the beginning because it's like a big investment up front you know we're lucky with now with the what we've been doing with mystery school each thing that we make kind of funds the next thing that we make so you you invest in like your first project and you know we've gotten to a point where it just kind of sustains itself um and it just keeps us going i think you know erica you you do stuff on patreon which seems yeah, like yeah. a really cool way to like you speaking of you know i was saying that i was self-indulgent um you know, with doing uh, your disorder art and putting that stuff up there. And I, I want to hear more about that. Yeah, so um, it, to sort of tie it into what we've just been talking about, you have Patreon is just sort of a subscription platform. So what you do with it is entirely up to you. I, I have friends who run uh, zine mailing clubs out of their Patreon, where if you join that month, you get that month's zine posted to you and stuff like that. Um, I know people who use it for essays. I, I use it as sort of a uh, place to stick everything. <laughs> um, so sketchbooks go up there, uh, short comics go up there, um, work in progress stuff, uh, script, scans by scripts, um, things like that. And it's just a, it's a sort of regular, regular download of what I'm up to and what stuff I'm doing. And that's that's great to to be able to put together a community like that that cares about the work that you're doing and kind of sees um, sees behind the curtain a little bit so that when your next book comes out they're kind of primed. I know I'm primed just from reading uh, what I've read thus far. It's really neat that you're giving uh, your fans an opportunity to see your work as it's as it's coming along and to see older stuff and, and the sketchbook yeah, I, stuff I'm sure is brilliant. I think that comes from a lot of, I read a lot of um, Kieran Gillen's stuff on how he writes and his artist notes for his comics and stuff like that, which really helped me to sort of, showing people how you're doing stuff is a really great, way to help them do stuff i think Absolutely. yeah process yeah. i love process stuff i love back matter i love that your patreon sounds like the the graphic novel back matter that i want to read first you yeah. know it's like yes. or if you've read the comic all this stuff goes to inform like what you were doing with that so it sounds like such a great outlet yeah know? like um sort of in the first year of it so disorder came out of i spent about two years doing art psychotherapy as a patient not a therapist um and it sort of came out of going along each week and spending an hour doing a piece of art and then looking at that piece of art in the context of all the other week's pieces of art and going, how am I feeling compared to last week based on this piece of art? And how patterns and motifs and repeating things. So it wasn't, I wasn't sitting down and going, oh, I know what I'll do today. I was just sitting down and you, you do whatever. And then about four or five months into it you'd look back and you go well this keeps turning up and that's interesting and I was really interested to see how that works with comics because obviously with comics you're juxtaposing things and patterns and you're sort of primed to look for that stuff in comics anyway yeah, so that's I think, where it came from and I think that, um, that that's, that's exceptional thinking because my favorite thing about comics are light motifs and recurring motifs. And I think when you are self-publishing, you know, whether you like lingo or not, you're exhibiting your brand. And when Becky was talking about back matter, one thing that I always like to put in all of my anthologies is uh, something sort of that happens after the fact, you know, a little bit of the makings of. So for instance, in Hey Amateur, I did, an afterword on 
how to kickstart a campaign, or I should say how to kickstart a successful campaign. And so I actually wrote uh, a nine panel grid story and had an artist illustrate sort of the ups and downs of my own adventure, kickstarting the Hey, I'm Not Sure campaign, which was my second one. And something else that I think is really fun that I know, I know it from, from mystery school, you guys have a lot of, of stickers and you throw in a lot of freebies when you do fulfillment. And my husband, Philip and I have been doing loot bags, which I think have become a signature now for all of the projects I do. And I'm not gonna lie, this is my favorite thing to design and assemble. Because I'm stealing I'm, that I, idea. <laughs> you are, I stole the idea from someone else, Rory Phillips, who is a tremendous graphic designer. That's so publishing. <laughs> Everyone steals right. each other's ideas <laughs> right? in a good well, way. <laughs> hey, appropriation is fine. Andy Warhol did it. If Warhol did it and Edie Sedgwick did it, it's like legit okay for you to do it too. That's my life philosophy. It, that's but, kind of the thing in self-publishing is kind of anything goes because you don't have anyone that you're asking permission from. Right. You can make what, whatever topics, whatever things you want to address there's stuff that happens in self-published comics that could never happen even at the most liberal minded right. publisher because there, there's just too many too many cooks in the kitchen when you're yeah. self-publishing it can be you just being right. as as bad as you want to be uh you bring bring a friend you know uh, right. like i said my experience was working as a collective so it was, and it kind of remains that way. It's encouraging other people around you. The more of us doing self-publishing and s stealing each other's ideas, biting each other's stuff, that's going to make us all collectively stronger. And it's going to really drive the point home that where the real stuff is going on is in people's little private worlds, through their little web shops, Yep. Um, through these comics that only you know dozens of people might end up with them in their hands but to I know that my weird little comics have touched people they've made people feel physically ill they've made people feel sad <laughs> yes. I, I'm raising my hand for that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> one, one of your comics made me start to grow strange things on my hands so <laughs> I don't know what that says about you and me but it you know the thing that's great is <clears throat> that you've all touched upon today is that you are accountable. You know, you are the master of your own destiny. So you have this opportunity to create. There's no excuse anymore. I like to tell people that putting insider art together um, in under three months during a global pandemic, which I know sounds like I'm bragging, I kind of am, but there was a community of us that did it. Look, you can make stuff happen or you can go back to bed and the greatest thing about being in 2020 right now is that you've got the tools, you've got the resources, you've got the people who are happy to help you out a little bit, but it's up to you. Bottom line, you know, you, you've got to make it happen and you j just be fearless, like be fearless, mess up. That's the best way to get ahead. It, like, it's a double-edged sword of you have complete creative control, which is amazing. You get to pick your book size, you get to pick how you print your book. So like, uh, at Disquette, Disquette does risograph printing. So this is the, um, sorry, this is the do it at the same USA season. version of Disquette. And this is the UK version. And it's a different printing method, different size, different binding, different cover. And I find sort of, I'm still learning that stuff, but it's really exciting. But I also think it's intimidating as well. And people are like, should I print at home on a printer or at, um, at a, print on demand place or what method should I use how do I do dimensions and I think the thing is I think the best advice is go and find stuff so like if you if you're wondering if you should print at home go find stuff that people have printed on their home printers and see what you think of it you know what one of my best selling things of of the entirety of my self-publishing life um, was a 24-hour comic that I did a year ago today, pretty much. And I did it super sloppy and wild. And, you know, it's a 24-hour comic. I, I was 
stress just to get through it. For those of you who don't know, it's when you spend 24 hours making a 24 page comic and what you get is what you get. I got through it, it took me 22 hours. Um, and I decided that for me, the best way to publish this was to go down to my local print shop where they make Xerox copies and make it punk rock, you know, just make it a yeah. zine. I think and some people are afraid to do that though, because they feel that it has to be slick and it has to be professional because the stuff they get in the comic shops is slick and professional. And I think it just does it though. Is that what's best for what you're doing? Because right, let the story, did, let the story determine. I think you should let the story determine the format and, and also yeah. your finances. You know, so many people don't yeah. have the funds, which again, we're talking about, about self-publishing in different ways to crowdfund. And maybe digital first is the best method for someone who doesn't have the extra cash on hand, but you can definitely go from stage to stage. And then you can, you know, like Becky was saying, add some back matter when you go to print, that makes it even more of a collector's item. That makes, that gives another reason to your fan base to not only have the digital version, but then want the physical version because, you know, there's something in there. Um, another thing that I'll just show off quickly, which, I think is a lot of fun. I love to do these messy montages in my books where I, I literally throw things on a table and take a photo and then do a little key of process work. So you've got character sketches, you've got rejected panels. In one case, there are some, even some red pen notes for aspiring editors in the room. <laughs> so this is my chance to show people warts and all the makings of uh, an astounding body of work. And I think that that's the most exciting part of publishing right now is that anyone can do it. Anyone can get their work out there. And back in the days when I was starting out in 1988, it was not the case. You know, the people that are creating today have no excuse. You know, if you've got a gut instinct about something, just go for it. And don't be afraid to reach out for help and don't be afraid to mess up. That's a great place to end it on. Um, I agree 100%. Uh, there's, there's no screwing up. There's no shame. Just get out there and, and make something. Um, make, leave, leave behind something. I always say that people say, oh, you make so many things. And it's, I, it's because I see my end. I see, I feel my body. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a really but, happy note to end. Oh my God. I'm going to play my little <laughs> tiny violin for Michael right now to, to take us out, uh, to take us out of this program. I know you, you had such an uplifting, cool thing. <laughs> talk about my <laughs> Death is coming. This is, this is so what I have to live than with. Too. Yeah. You have to live with this, Becky. I do feel for you. That, <laughs> shows, that shows why I self-publish though, doesn't it? Because like, I had to, you said something really cool and empowering, and then I brought it back to me and my own morbidity. Anyway, you can find me on <laughs> social medias, um, Michael W. Con at Michael W. Conrad on Twitter and Instagram. Becky, where are they going to find you? I'm at Becky Clunan on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, and our web shop together is Mystery School Backslit. What is it? MysterySchool.BigCartel.com. Yeah, we need your money. We need money. <laughs> Erica, where are we going to find you? Uh, I'm at Erica Price Art on Instagram and Twitter. And my uh, web shop is ericapriceart.storemd.com. Do, do go there and get disorder, y'all. Yeah, I also need money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we need money. Shelly, how about you? I can be found on Twitter at sxbond on Instagram at SX Bond Imprimatur, on Facebook, and I've got a website for Black Crown that's still very cool to check out. There are 10 amazing great graphic novels I edited for IDW a few years ago. You can go to Black Crown HQ, and yeah, just keep making comics, people. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Be fearless. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Go have go have some fun. <laughs> comics, are, comics, are kill you. comics are gonna kill you. Uh, let me stop recording. Hey, th <laughs> thanks. I haven't stopped recording. Thought Bubble, thank you so much for having us. We love you, and um, I hope that everyone's being safe.
and that we get back on track and that we're all able to have our meat bodies together in the same room again one day. Goodbye. <laughs>